right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, I know it's a little cold and drizzling out there, so we always love it when we can have our parent community come in. Um, hopefully you had a chance to take a look at some of our do now questions. And we're not going to ask you to raise your hand if it took you, you know, three times to get your driver's license. We'll just allow you to think about that yourself. I'm certainly not going to tell you that myself. Um, we would welcome you here tonight to our Freedom to Fail, the Gift of Failure workshop. My name is Sandy Katie. I'm the Assistant Principal at Greenbrook and Cambridge Schools. And I have Amy Finkelstein, who is our Supervisor for Student Assistance and Wellness, K-12 in our district. So the, the big idea for tonight's activity, for tonight's workshop, is really to demystify um, the word fail as it's a negative connotation and really teach ways to be able to make positive failures in a way that supports children, helps them grow, and helps them learn and adjust and, and really be a, a part of our world and understand that's what life is like. So we have a couple of essential questions up here. Um, you can read them, but if you think about you know, the, the idea behind them is you know, preparing our children in a way that we push them to do their best, but also understand that we're keeping their mental wellness in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, we'll talk about the idea of growth mindset, um, the research behind growth mindset, and how that supports a positive failure, and then how we as parents and, and teachers and, and members of our community around children can create fail-friendly environments so that children can learn to take risks maybe make mistakes, maybe even fail at things, but do it in a way that um, we as the adults around can support and move them forward so that they can learn and grow from those mistakes. Hey everyone. Um, this is not a brand new workshop. It has been done in prior years by other administrators. Um, we're excited to bring it back and look at it a little bit through a different lens tonight. Thinking about um, our district and the strategic planning goals that we've been working on, have any of you, um, just by a show of hands, come out to any of the town hall meetings or been part of talking about strategic planning, the different goals in the community? A couple of you. Um, some of the, the work that we're doing really revolves around the mental health of our kids and supporting them developmentally and emotionally and giving them coping skills um, as they're growing from K through 12. We're really looking at what we want them to do as well as they can academically and to feel challenged. We also want to teach them um, how to manage their emotions, how to develop relationships with people, um, how to build connections. and really how to know whether or not they're feeling okay and how to take care of themselves and get help. And that was because when we chatted with the community and different student and staff groups, that was a really big priority, was to make sure that everybody wants their students to do well, but we also want to feel like they're safe at school and that we have a nurturing climate and, and that they can handle themselves as they get older um, and know when to seek help and when to get help for others too. Um, so just in thinking about the planning, one of our main building goals has to do with counseling um, and looking at student support. Where can we improve our, our counseling in terms of group and individual lessons? Thank you. And um, also our are there maybe, maybe assessments that we can look at to get some sc screening tools for our kids to figure out where they're at emotionally? And how can we, we have a lot of services in place, but how can we do better? Um, oh, there we are, there's Sandy. So the other piece of it was the social emotional learning goals. And we have a committee in the district as well. It's not the focus of tonight's workshop, but social emotional learning is all about developing competencies in kids at all ages to learn to identify their feelings um, and learn to function well with others, learn how to disagree respectfully, how to be problem solvers and critical thinkers. And we want to embrace that mentality as well as looking at growth mindset and teaching kids how to learn from failures, that we all fall and how do we gracefully get back up again um, and, and just learn how to cope. Teaching them resiliency and how to be resourceful and when they're not sure what to do, who to go to for help. So the New Jersey Department of Ed 
Um, this, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but the definition of social emotional learning is the process of learning and gathering information about truly the skills to understand and manage emotions. Like I said, um, empathy is something that we've been teaching kids through elementary school for years um, as part of our CARES initiatives um, and making good choices. And outcomes show that kids who have good social emotional learning skills tend to do better academically, their grades go up on standardized test scores, they're more relaxed, they have better study skills, they're sleeping better, so they're able to learn and remember and retain information. And we also see data that suspension rates go down, discipline goes down, um, overall climate improves. So it's not just that we want our, our kids to be able to mentally handle things, but overall academic performance will increase if we help kids focus on social emotional behaviors too. So this is just a graphic of the keys to social and emotional learning. Um, Maurice Elias works out of Rutgers. He's one of the top gurus on social emotional learning and we've connected with him through our district a few times um, to work with him on what are some initiatives that we can try. And if you look, the five core competencies of SEL are self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. So what we are looking to do over the next few years um, is to talk about how to infuse all of these competencies within our curriculum. Not just when a counselor comes in to give a lesson because that's great, but it's not happening every day, right? So we want to make sure that our teachers understand that even in math, in science, there are ways to build in all of these skills throughout everything that we're teaching during the day. Um, and, and being more explicit about it. Like if we're doing a science lab, how do we work with a partner? How do we know how to solve a scientific problem? And we can use a lot of the strategies too in social studies and talk about debating difficult current event topics and how to relate to people that might have different perspectives than you. So we're going to show a quick video um, just on social emotional learning created by Castle. Social and emotional skills are the essential skills for success in school, work, and life. Social emotional learning centers their mind and body. It reduces their emotional tension so they can be open to new content and material. We find that academic outcomes increase exponentially when students are nurtured, loved, and cared for, that we get much more out of them when we first address social emotional needs. So for us, it's actually an academic intervention and not just an emotional one. If we expect students to be college and career ready, it's important for us to focus on these skills and competencies. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Self-awareness is the ability to identify your emotions, to be able to tie thoughts and feelings to behaviors. We find that self-awareness is one of the hardest things for young people. Being aware of their own body space and the impact of their words and emotions on other people. So a lot of the work we do is reflective through conflict mediation, through circles, through journaling, having them see their own impact on the world and then how to shift that or make a different choice next time. Self-management is the ability to self-motivate, to have self-control, to regulate one's emotions. In the classroom, that may be a breathing exercise, or that might be counting five, or taking a break. So with students who don't really know how to deal with their anger, or don't really know how to resolve conflict, we're giving them a tool that helps them deal with it in a less stressful way. Social awareness is about embracing diversity, showing empathy for others. Activities might include service learning projects, addressing social justice issues. Role playing is a great opportunity for students to address how a person might have felt in a conflict on the, on the playground. We're going to 
to see if other people have had some of the very same experiences around bullying that we've had. You're in my boat if you have a bully now. Wow, I see a lot of people. Relationship skills are important in project-based learning. It's the ability to work cooperatively with someone, to resolve conflict. It's the one skill you need your whole life. You may not need calculus tomorrow, but you have to know how to have a working relationship, whether it's for a coworker or a life partner. You have to know how to handle conflict and how to handle challenges. Sometimes at recess, Miney would come over and like just start talking about us and saying mean things. Is it your job to make Danae's job at school hard? No. I know it's a form of bullying, and sometimes I'll say sorry to her. So you choose to be someone's ally and make a better choice. Responsible decision making is considering the well-being for self and others. It's evaluating the consequences for various behaviors or actions. We do this through shared agreements, one-to-one -one problem solving, or having students debate an issue. If you were like, hey, Kashida, what can I, uh, how much does an A cost in this class? And you like took out your wallet and you know, and I was like, oh, I think 50 bucks would work. Which one of us would be corrupt in that case? You're the one that's asking for the money. We're truly teaching these students to be productive citizens. We're teaching them life skills. We're teaching them how to problem solve effectively. We're teaching them how to be resilient. I think of all the billions of dollars we've spent on Title I and all these intervention programs. And, and when all is said and done, what do we have to show for it? I think we're, you know, we're trying to teach technical things instead of devoting some of the resources to teach who you are as a person. Once you know who you are, then learning becomes exciting because you've already established a discipline. It's important for teachers and principals to understand that it can't be a binder off the shelf. It can't be something that happens from 2.15 to 4.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It has to be part of the school culture. Giving teachers flexibility, giving them a range of skills, giving them different ways that it can look, and allowing them to take their own personality and match that to the, what they want in their classroom has been the best way to get authentic, true practice. If we continue to do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we always got. Is that good enough? I don't think it's good enough for the 21st century. We need to be the outliers to try things that have never been tried and see if they work. What are we waiting for? Um, Amy has a high schooler and a middle schooler, so 
We are certainly not the experts in this. We live this and are living this very much like you live it and are living it right now. Um, but what we have done is kind of do some research and, and uh, live a little bit more through it. Um, so hopefully we can use some of those skills that we have learned um, to help you with that. So, so the idea of failing forward, um, and one of the things that I, I built at, because I do some work on the elementary level with engineering and math, and to me, the family forward really speaks to the design model that we look at for, for those um, kind of areas of math and, and, uh, and science and engineering. The idea that you try something, it may or may not work. But in science or in engineering, if something doesn't work, you don't just stop, give up, run away, and never do it again, right? You go, you, you see what worked, you see what didn't work. You try something new, you adjust, you pivot a little bit, and, um, and then see if that works, and you learn from that. So. The idea of trying and failing multiple times at times to get to success really speaks um, very closely to what we're teaching our children who are spending education. Um, for those of you who parents who are in the STEM field, you probably have lived this very much and have maybe this like what about it in terms of, of your own children, but it's something that really for me connected closely to um, what we're wanting for our own children. Move into the um, idea of growth mindset. Is anybody here familiar with growth mindset or what that might mean? Any thoughts? We are always looking for the solution, whatever the situation may be. So if your thinking is positive or positive, and you need to prepare, you learn from that to move forward. Absolutely. So finding the opportunities even in failure and looking for what what can be positive. So the idea of failing forward. You fail, it happens, but now what? Any other thoughts on growth mindset? So outcome versus effort. The, the process of the process of what have you learned and what steps have you taken? Maybe everything wasn't a failure. Maybe in a project, some of it went really well, and some of it didn't. Um, and so, correct, you know, learning about the process and being proud of the steps that you've been able to take. So, this is Carol Sweat. Um, she is an expert in group mindsets and really um, talks about a fixed mindset is the belief that you are born with a certain amount of intelligence. And it might vary a little bit, but it's sort of saying, well, look, either you're a really great intelligent kid, you're always going to do pretty well, or you're going to struggle. Maybe you're, you know, not born that way, and you have to work really hard. And um, the opposite would be the world mindset is that intelligence can be changed and developed over time, that you are always learning and growing. Um, we're going to give you a little quiz that you can see. And you can either see it like, you know, from your own perspective or thinking, what, what would my child say? So it's a little hungry too. We're going to pass those out um, in a second. Um, I'm going to go over this for you first, um, just to get you about it a little bit more. And this is what we do to teaching kids, even at elementary level. We talk about growth mindset. Any of us at elementary level books that we read about your brain being elastic and being like a muscle and you have to exercise your brain in order for it to learn and grow like any other muscle. You have to practice. Um, and that's how kids understand it. It works better when you exercise. If you don't work out and then you do, you're going to be short. You're going to get hurt. So we have to keep practicing. Um, and often students believe that either like, I'm good at math or I'm not good at math. I just always say I'm not, I'm not a math person. I'm an English person. And I always believe that. I just never do good at math. Um, and maybe I could be good at math. I don't know. Um, I think it was that mentality that you can be one or the other. You can be a math person, or you can be good at all the other stuff. Um, so really challenging that maybe in kids. It's not that you're not good at math, or you're really only good at English and social studies, but you just haven't learned it yet. Um, and so we try to teach kids that mentality of, Maybe you don't know it yet. Maybe you need more practice and how can we break it down um, and build success. Um, and again, the idea that every time you work hard, you create new connections in your brain. The kids actually are learning now um, about 
color brain works, the parts of the brain that store memory and that are good for organizing and how it all works together. They love what you have. They like the science behind it um, to see how their brain can learn and make connections and get stronger. So this is a little quiz. You can take this for yourself to help you understand do you have more of a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Um, it's always fun to do this. Um, I know I that I was a little surprised at the results for myself. Something new for me to learn. So thank you, Miss. Oh, let's do that first. Uh, written for coaches, 
But think about it from your own perspective of your child, of your student. It could be someone that you coach, someone that you teach um, lessons to, or whatever um, area you're looking at. Um, but how could you look at this article and think about it with your own child? So we're going to use some time to read that and talk about it with the group. I'll give you about 15 minutes to do that. Wrong 
kind of what you, what you did right and how you're going to use what you did right to continue moving forward. So thank you for that. I have a teacher wait time. I can stand and stare at you guys for a while. So I have a, a, a completely well, what I think to be a, a different process because I found that what I'm what I feel like I'm learning is that I need to unlearn some of the thing, all the stuff. Because like when I think the first thing I thought of is as an adult, I'm tall. I remember learning: don't work harder or smarter. When I'm at work, you're not working harder; you're working smarter. The opposite. I also hear um, failure is not an option. <laughs> so that, so it's it's not it to me, and this is what I'm sharing my kids. It's not my kids that have to do a lot of the gym. It's me. Um, We've been doing a good job with your kids um, throughout the schools. We exercise some groups too. That you know, you'll hear in elementary and even in middle and high school the power of yes the word yes, and how powerful that is. So when, it, when your children say to you, I can't do this, I can't do this math homework, well, you can't do it yet. So what is it that we can help with? What, what do you need from me, and, and where do you feel you're struggling? Have them, talk about that kind of self-management piece, we heard about the social emotional learning skills. Um, how, is our, how are our children learning to self-assess um, and know what they need from the adults, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a parent? We want to give them what they need, not we think they need. So you're right, and the failure's not an option now. I think that's um, that's true. We've always been told that. So. so failure in and of itself has been just such a, a failure because <laughs> you know, you're know, not explaining that that is the process. It's all the failures that we've had in life that has brought us to where we are, but we have so many other ways that we keep saying the opposite. So we, we are telling you that failing is okay and that you forward and that the world out there is telling you that failure is not an option and, and those things that are just, it's a bad, it's a bad word. I was telling a quick group over here and I'll, I'll embarrass myself a little bit. My son's mom had a six shift car and he tried teaching me how to, how to drive it and um, we forget as adults because we naturally kind of move away from things that we can't do. We don't just like try new things. Learning how to drive that spaceship was the most embarrassing thing in my life. I was mortified. I gave up. I was like, I can't do it. And my son was like, oh, come on. And then I was in the car, and he's like, oh, put the, put the clutch on it. And he's telling me, and he's yelling at me. I mean, but as adults, how often do we ever put ourselves in situations where we have a good chance of failing? And I think for me, it became really um, important for me to learn that, because now with students and with my own, ch my own child, I know how it feels when kids are trying to think. We're constantly making kids try to think, right, as parents. Go okay, we'll take high classes, or go go for the basketball team, or go take that really high level math class. And then we forget what it feels like when they struggle. Because we haven't, we naturally kind of, you know, we're all in careers for a reason, right? I'm not a, you know, I'm not an engineer for a reason. I'm in, you know, so we, we put ourselves in areas where we have had talent. And I forget that our kids don't always have that. We forget what it's like to feel that failure. So um, it's a good reminder for me and a good reminder kind of what it's like for our kids. So how? So can I um, interject in? Because there was a good conversation in the back about we're not saying, like, let's just watch our kids fail and, like, over the best. I mean, some failure is OK. We know that like, some kids need our help, right? There's a point, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, where we have to say, you need help, I'm going to work with you. We're going to get a teacher, a counselor. We're going to figure out how to give you what you need to have the tools to do it. I'm going to do it all for you. But talking about like failing forward doesn't mean we're just going to watch you like sink or swim. Um, we do want kids to learn before, like we were saying, before they're 25 years old, um, how to how to handle a mistake and not always be rescued. We talked about like helicopter and snowplow parents, and not that I, you know, love these. I mean, I'm one of them too. But you know, we want to jump in and see if you can make sure that they're okay and safe, and that they're not upset, and they're embarrassed, they're struggling. But we'd rather have them learn younger than never have that ability to be resilient as an adult, because then you end up seeing people who quit jobs because they can't go off the boss and they can't be part of a team, or the first time they're given any feedback, they get upset and they quit and they can't do it. So 
that's a big part of what we're trying to teach kids. Like, you're going to get negative feedback in your life. You're not going to get an F, but you might not get a great evaluation every time. Or you might have to work with people that you don't like working with. Um, and that's, that's life. Um, um, question number one, right? I, I guess I'm confused of two things, right? Uh, it's very important, and I'm, I'm nothing to hijack the growth mindset session here, but it's also the definition of failure. It's so related, right? When you define failure, what does failure to mean? May not even fa may not even mean failure to someone else on the other table. My failure, the other person on the other table may be thinking, "Hey, you did so well. That's success to me." That's your failure. So, yeah. So there's no universal or rational definition of failure because that's so much competition driven. Uh, so I think that is one of the key aspects, right? I mean, so someone's got to, so that's that's an, that's one thing. And the second thing is when you're talking about growth mindset, right? Uh, you're also talking about decision making, right? So parents cannot trust what usually parents try to live their life through the kids. Right? If I want to do something, I want my son or daughter to do something, right? You trust something on it. And then you can't say I'm following the growth mindset because he doesn't like it or she doesn't like it. Right? It is not it is not natural to them, right? So that's also a very important aspect, right? I mean growth mindset I think it applies to people or kids, even at, even us as adults, to pick and choose what comes naturally to us and then apply the growth mindset. Right? It is if I, if I, my kids are not even right. So I'm not going to get into mountain climbing. I right. never have exactly. a growth mindset right. that that would be something really fun and big for me. It's right. never going to happen. So I think you're right. And I think about my, I was thinking about this last night. My two kids, my daughter started in Taekwondo when she was about five years old. And she loved it. Her whole goal was to be a black belt. And she went through all the belt, and she was little, it was the cutest thing ever, you know, she would, like, the boys, and it, it was cute. Um, and, but we really wanted her to develop skills to be able to be a little bit tougher and assertive, and, and yet, six years old, you're not truly learning to, like, defend yourself in an alley, but for her to know that she can take care of herself as she gets older, and um, we loved it, and she loved it, and then as she got um, into, like, later in middle school, she got really into theater, and she wanted to do auditions and sing and be on stage, and, and that's great, and we wanted to promote that, but we were like, but right, like, you gotta get, you know, we gotta keep it up. We, we've been paying every month for a thousand years for you to get these belts. And at one point, she just said, this isn't fun for me anymore. Like, I'm done. I, I don't want to do it. And of course, I'm like, we're about to do a contract. So, like, you can't get out of the contract, and you're brown belt, and you felt like, but like you're right here. Um, it was killing us. And for a while, we were like, you're going. Like, uh, we're going. And like, one day, she just looked at me in tears, and she's like, why are you making me go to this thing where like I'm getting kicked pretty hard because now I'm good, and I'm fighting with black belts, and they're knocking me down. And she just looked at me in tears and was like, why? I'm like, oh, we're done. We're done. Like, go be on stage. You have to stay long there. Um, my son, he's 12 now. He's already a second to to great black belt. He's had moments where he said, like, I'm not really into it anymore, and somehow he gets re-motivated. And now he's on track to be, like, a, a junior instructor and leadership, and he's doing volunteers. Like, he has a goal of, who knows, he's tough, but he wants to own a karate studio when he gets older. And the amount of, like, discrimination, and he falls down, he gets back up. He breaks up, and he, he goes back in two months later. So, it's amazing to watch him and the determination, but like you said, that's his thing, like that's his natural, like he loves it. Um, he loves to teach little kids, um, they love him, it's a great fit. My daughter, we, we tried, we didn't want her to like, give up. We felt like we were giving up. Right. But no, she changed her mind. Right. She did. She could always go back, she'll still be around well. But we would have made her hate it right. if we kept pushing. And just to spin out, you had a really interesting point. That the failure is relative, right? What you consider a failure and what you're doing may be different than what I consider a failure. And I think the growth mindset piece of it is what you do with that failure. So I feel like I failed because I couldn't drive that standing car that I bought for my son. Um, and you may be because you, you know, I don't know, didn't, couldn't get on the mountain climbing. 
But what we do with it is a growth mindset. Do we say, I'm stupid, I'm uncoordinated, I'll never be able to do that again? Or do we say, you know what, I can't get it yet, but what do I need to do in practice to try it? So you're absolutely right. Everyone's vision of failure, their version of it, is going to be different. And I think that that's a really good point to bring up. But we tend to think of failure in terms of, of you know, the job you have, or the ability to do something, or play, whatever it is. But you're right, it could be in your own mind. You feel like you failed because of this, what to me may be the simplest little thing. But it's what you do when, you're, when your first inclination is, I failed. What do you do next? What is your get? What do you then work on and try and have you overcome that? That we all do, as adults we do. You're all, you know, you're here, you're, you're heartbreaking, you're your parents, you know, you all overcome something in your lives. And, and we need to teach our children how to do that. So very good point to come there. All right, how about the second one? So you read this, this came from more of a coach's point of view. How would you apply this um, to your own relationship with children? What are some things that were like aha moments? I know I saw some note taking, I saw some underlining. Where was your aha moment maybe from this article? I don't think it's because of that as well, but the world wants to know 
that we have resilient children and resilient adults coming into their world, whether it's their college world or it's their job world. We, they want to know that. They don't want kids who are necessarily perfect who've never struggled. Because eventually, it's going to happen. We all have had things happen in our lives where we've had to struggle. And the more that we can kind of help them in it in a way that, you know, they're not, I just tell this group, we don't want our kids to like quit school and go surfing for a living, obviously. But we want them to, when they struggle, help them through it when we're there so that they can have that skill, learn from it, and then when it happens as a college kid or as an adult, they're prepared for it. At the point that you just brought in, uh, um, about your son, you are glad that when he was going through that case, he was under the roof of uh, the uh, you know, And that's very interesting actually. I never thought about that, but it's very interesting because now you can be with them in mm -hmm. their failure or uh, time of it. Yeah, yeah. It, it is because, I mean, we, we, kids are going to fail yeah. at something, right? So we're. And I think this, for me, is just making me think a little bit, tying it back to the social emotional learning piece, um, when you think about kids who, who struggle socially, right, because we've talked a little bit about the academic type of failure and sports and persevering, but we have a lot of kids who feel like social failures, whether they don't fit in. We were talking a little bit about like the social media and the impact um, of seeing like if people are hanging out without you or if you're not invited to something and you thought you had these friends, but tomorrow you don't have the same friends. And I think this is a skill, like learning about the growth mindset is also a skill to help socially to think, you know what, what, maybe there are some social skills I need to be developing. Maybe I need to work on developing empathy or sensitivity or work on my active listening skills. Um, not, I'm not worthy of having friends. And that's often what we see are kids who have anxiety and fears over there's something wrong with me. People don't like me, that it must be that I'm not I'm not likable. And I think being able to develop some of these social skills little by little, and again the same type of phrase for our kids. You were a good friend today, you were a good helper. Um, you don't we're not focusing on the outcome of having a million friends and being invited to every party, but we're focusing on you know, did you do something good for others, or did you, um, you know, were you able to help out with a younger child today? Like, to being able to develop that self-awareness can go so far. And so I think that while we're developing um, the growth mindset for sports and for everything else, and talking about having grit, we talk about that a lot, it's the same thing with friendships. It's a growth process. Some kids just have it in their social and they attract a million friends and some it's hard and, and they really need help. And knowing that having only a couple of friends, it's fine. It's okay. It's the quality and it's about that process of being able to engage with other people. Um, so I just want to kind of point that out too. It's just another area that for us, we feel like it's really important to be well-rounded. I just wanted to share one Actually, example that happened, uh, I mean, pretty much it was somewhat related to what strategies were given here. So, my son is very shy, I did mention about that. He is very, very quiet, but he's very good at academics. Uh, I try to put him on all the sports and games wherever I can see, you know, he might have an interest in it and so on. I will try to last for five years, I'm still trying to hide him up. Last year, he wanted to play basketball, and uh, I mean, he's shy at the same time, he is a bit slow. In the entire team, I could see that he's with so I never told that to him. Uh, I don't want to be more with And I, I was wondering, you know, how the coach is going to take it up and all that. You know, he attended all the practice sessions, and the match, he never gets a shot. But, you know, the coach still always gave him all the opportunities. In the last few sessions, uh, during practice time, the coach always picks up my son. He says, you're the only kid who will listen, and you exactly follow the instructions, what do I give? So you go first, like that the coach motivated him and the coach always tries, tries to bring, bring him forward. And it really helped and even this year he's going and he finally managed to get some shots. Yeah. And I would give the credit to the coach who did it first time because he never gave up on my son and that's the only thing that tried to motivate my son. And he praised the ability to take feedback. Yes. And, and just yes. use it and not get this first. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, especially when the coach says that you are listening and you're paying attention and you're doing it well. You know, whether he wasn't doing well or not, but all that positive thoughts in him 
kind of game or you know, where the go. And so the process, not the product. We're talking about that, the process piece of it. Yes. So we're, we're, we we've spent all day all talking about this, but I want to push the time to be able to move a little bit forward on. Um, we can skip actually the next slide, but we already talked about that before. So we'll, we'll just go ahead and so we're going to go over, we're going to use strategies, right? So, so bring, okay. so you may have seen this Michael Jordan. Um, this is really why he succeeded because of all the shots that he took. Um, he succeeded because of all the failure that he had, um, missing the game, missing the many shots, the shots that he didn't make. Um, this is a very, you want to show this real quick? Like this cute. Yeah. Right, this is cute. So, and then we'll go into some strategies of things that you can do. Dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time, she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. A teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything, and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiance died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown, and he was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never lived. Now here's the part you really want to know about, right? So we've talked a lot about this already, um, just through our natural conversations. What do you do at home to create that felt-friendly home? To have opportunities for students to maybe fail something or not succeed at something in a way that you can teach, grow, and have them learn from it. Um, and then we talked about this, it's fine, starting with small changes. Um, I work in an elementary school in New York's the high school, which is K-12, and we know how many parents drop off things in the morning on their I forgot my water bottle, I forgot my homework, I forgot my instrument, I forgot my math test, I forgot whatever it is, right? So you, I'm not going to tell you, I know I've done it, we've all done it, right? So thinking about what it is that you are comfortable with them forgetting and failing on. So you know what, if they forgot their instrument because you told them to put it next to the door so they didn't forget it and they forgot it, then they forgot it. And if the teacher says something, well, we told you we need to think of that. Um, obviously, it's a study guide for a big math test. That's a little bit different, right? You may not be ready yet, yet, to let your kid forget that study guide. Right? The other thing you see also is parents who come at the end of the day after school's ended because their kid forgot their homework, their kid forgot their study guide, whatever. So think about what you you can start off with, what's comfortable for you. So if they forget their homework and they get that zero in, in Genesis, you know, that they're going to learn it. They're going to actually put it in that folder at the end, at the end of when they're doing their homework and getting ready for the next day. Um, giving strategies to your child instead of just jumping in and trying to solve it for them. As Amy said, we all have some version of helicopter and snow cloud parenting. We've all done it. Um, if your child's having difficulty in class, if there's a student that's bothering them or a student that they're like, want to be friends with, model for them maybe some of the strategies. We had that conversation in one of our tables about you know, teaching your child to walk up to someone and say, hey, do you want to play with me? And if they say no, what do you do next? Right? Because not every kid's going to necessarily want to play at a certain time. So not just how to do it, but how to react when someone does something that maybe is different than what you want them to do. Privacy at home is important, too, so start up with those household chores. And you know what? When they make, when you tell them to make the bed, this is my problem. I tell him to make the bed, and then he makes the bed, and then I go and remake it because I wanted it clear. Right? We've all done this before, right? Allowing it to be. If you tell your son to make the bed before he goes to school in the morning, and it's not, it's some, it's some approximated version of making the bed, 
live with it, right? What can you handle? Um, have you been able to clear the table up? What is it like to put the dishes in the dishwasher? Whatever it is, have them start to have some responsibility there. And if, it, and if they fail, if they don't clean the dishes with the dishwasher, and it comes out with a sticky stuff still on it, well, then now you need to clean it again. So we're having them learn from those mistakes, that they can move on in very small increments, but in ways that are very powerful. Tell them about your failures. I just told you about my failure. I mean, you guys can do that with your own children. When you have a bad day at work, tell them about it. You know what? I forgot to bring my laptop to school and to work to school. To work and I had this important meeting that I forgot about me. They need to hear those things too. You know, you're, you're their heroes. So if you're making mistakes and you're okay with it, then they'll be okay with it. And they'll learn from it as you're as you're as your first if you're their first teachers. Using goals instead of rewards. Um, you know, there's always that we always want to do. If you do this, this is you're going to get this. Think about a goal for them. Setting goals for them. So you're going to do your homework and you're going to bring it to school every day for a week straight instead of saying we give you this if you do this. So I'm just trying to think about setting goals for them, helping them achieve those goals. What do you need from me to help you achieve that goal? So if you want your child to bring their homework and that's their your goal is to ensure they bring their homework, what can we do together to help support that? Is there a spot in your room where you'll remember it? Is there a spot um, in the, by the front door where we're going to put it? So helping them kind of learn how to reach those goals in a way that you can help them in supporting that. And the difference between intervention and rescue. Your parents, again, your parents, I have sent off emails to teachers because I let my child try it first and wasn't happy with the results, so I let them read. That's intervention. Rescuing is your child comes home and says, you know, Miss Nicholson was mean to me today, and you should let me know off. Yeah. We know it. We have an administrator, so I know sometimes and we all do this. You hear your child, and the first thing you do is you send an email to the teacher. So let them try it first. And if they can't, or, or if they if they didn't get the result, then maybe you go in and talk to the teacher. You're like, I had I had Drew try to talk to you about this. I'm not sure that it was the answer that you were looking for, whatever that would be. But give them the opportunity so you're not continually going in and rescuing them. Yeah, I mean, I've said to my kids, you know, if there's a problem at school, whether something with a teacher, not, I can't think of too many goals, but like, if you need something with another kid, they said something mean and they upset you, you know, when, when they get to a certain age, I can all say, listen, what are you going to do about it tomorrow to so address it? Tell me your plan when you get to school. Who are you going to talk to? Because um, I feel like I want to give them a chance. If they don't or if they end up backing out of the plan, maybe then I need to do something if, if, if it's a safety issue. If it's something that we're going to get over in three days, I've learned to back off. But if, if there's something really going on, I want them to tell me like, how do you think you want to handle it. Because they don't want me you know, calling or emailing all the time, I'll say that this is something you want me to get involved in or is something that you can do by yourself. And then you just call me about it after. I feel differently about bullying. I feel like social dynamics, there are times where your kids can fend for themselves because we all have things where we get our feelings hurt or we feel a little bit left out or we misinterpret, but True bullying, if your kid is being hurt or intimidated or threatened or made fun of, you help your kid. Like, we don't want anybody feeling unsafe or bottom on that for anybody else. So, whether it's you then go to a teacher and say something, you don't want to let it go. You tell your kid, hey, remember all the lessons you've had with your counselors and your teachers talking about bullying and that we don't, we don't do that in school, we don't put up with it and it's not okay. And we don't want that expectation to be that it might happen to somebody else. So we want to fix it. So I feel like when it comes to safety and their mental health and making sure that they're you know, protected, that's an appropriate time to jump in. Because kids are little, they're not, they don't want to make trouble or they're, they're worried about repercussions. And so that's something where you may need to jump in. And if you don't know, you can always call your school. Administrator, counselor, teacher, and say, like, and I've gotten up all the time. I'm not sure what to do, like my kid is upset and worried, but I don't know if it's something like I should get involved in, do I call the other parent, do I file a report? Uh, call and chat with the school.
school if you're not sure. That's one of those like, yeah. You know, I mean, like that's a the main for us. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Your exit ticket to leave today. Date. It's cool we have kids to reflect on what they've learned. So if we're going to reflect on what we learned on the back, we have not written it. But on the back of this, you are going to think of one thing that you are going to do at home based on this conversation that you're going to allow your child to go on and help them through it. Whatever works for you, whether it's making the bed, whether it's talking to the friend, whatever it is. So you're going to this and how you reflect on one thing you've learned from today that you're going to take back and help your child fail forward on. Um, thank you very much. Um, we will be here if you have any questions. Uh, we have a couple more hand hands coming up. So Chris Mariana is going to us on that. Let you know that there are uh, there are copies and there will be copies in the public library. So if you didn't get a book tonight and you'd like to take a look at it, uh, I think we'll also put one in the um, South Pacific High School Library and um, maybe both middle schools. I have enough copies left to do that. Uh, our next workshop is Tuesday, March 24th, and it's a it's a similar it's a similar type of workshop and it's on transitions. Um, elementary to middle, middle to high, high school um, all up into uh, college and beyond, and helping you to get through those transitions while you help your child. Because sometimes, you know, they're doing a lot better with those transitions than we are. Um, it's that push-pull between dependence and independence. You want to let them go, you want to let them grow, but sometimes it's harder for us to deal with those transitions than it is for them. So, That'll be a great workshop. It's March 24th. There'll be lots of information coming along about it. But um, that's all for me. Um, Thanks for Jen. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer Semigay from Community Ed. I'm the annoying person that keeps sending you all these emails. I uh, just like to remind you that we're having our camp night on February 24th. So if you're interested and you've picked up one of the brochures for summer camp, that night we will be giving away, uh, we have door prizes, a raffle. Uh, one Chromebook, two half-off sessions, and one free session for summer camp. So if you, if you come that night, you have the opportunity to win one of those prizes. There's also, if you're registering for a camp that evening, it's at a discounted price. Uh, the coaches will be there for some of the sports, and some of the um, vendors that offer some of the, the uh, technology courses and some of the offerings will also be there, so you can meet some of the, the personnel and the staff for the summertime. So, February 24th, here, from 6 to 8. And that night will be the night that registration opens. So if you take one of the brochures that's outside and you find some classes that you're interested in, that's the night that registration opens on Community House. Thank you so much. Thank you.